Hey, everybody. This is Emily Leach. Super excited to be here. And welcome, everybody, back to the Freelance Business Week. I know we've had a ton of really great sessions. And it's been a lot of fun to read the comments, be a part of it. Because as you know, this year, it wasn't all put together by me. It was totally put together by all the amazing organizers through um, Austin and Buffalo and Miami and Tampa. I'm so appreciative for the work that they did. The um, A lot goes into an event like this. So the one speaker that I did bring in was a very good friend and colleague of mine, Ed Candia. A lot of you guys probably know him. And we're just going to kind of have an open conversation about just about being in a freelance business. So let's go ahead and bring Ed on real quick. Hey, Ed, there he is. Hey, how are you, Emily? I am doing good. So real quick, I want to let everybody know how comments work in case this is the first session that you're catching for Freelance Business Week. So the comments you can do at the bottom if you are already logged into like a YouTube account. Otherwise, it'll at the bottom say log into your YouTube account. So all of our comments actually work through YouTube. That's how we're funneling things through. And that way, Ed and I can see them right here. Perfect. So tell everybody in case there's some people. I can't imagine there's very many humans in the world that don't know who you are. But so for those few people that don't know, give everybody a little bit about you. Sure. So these days I, uh, and by the way, thank you for having me. It's, it's great to be here. I love what you're doing um, with this session and, and the creativity that went into, hey, let's make this happen, you know, <laughs> despite the fact that we got to change the format and everything. Yes. Um, so this is, this is great. Uh, Thanks. Uh, I dedicate pretty much 100% of my time these days to coaching and consulting. And I work with ambitious writers, copywriters, marketing consultants who um, know they could be doing a lot better in their businesses. So I tend to work with people who um, uh, are established. Uh, they, they have momentum. They've done this for a while, but they're, they're kind of stuck. And the way I got here is kind of, you know, like most things, right? It's directly. Um, so I was a writer and copywriter for many years. And before that, I came from the world of corporate sales. And I didn't even know that writing and content marketing was really a thing. Um, I fell into it because I was writing my own marketing materials as a sales professional working for a relatively small software company. Oh, wow. So I thought, hey, you know what? I bet that I could do this for a living. I was already kind of thinking <laughs> that I wanted to go out on my own. And sure enough, I mean, this is something that a lot of companies pay freelancers really good money to do. So um, I did that for about three years on the side while I kept my, my sales job. And eventually in 2006, I went completely on my own and the rest is history. So I did that for many, many years until 2012, 2013, I started transitioning into a little bit of coaching. And a couple of years ago, I finally started doing coaching um, full time. But, you know, I, I work with with writers, copywriters, marketing consultants and on the business side of things. I don't teach people how to write. I assume they know how to do that well, especially mm -hmm. if, the, you know, when they come to me, they have to have been doing well, which means that the craft side is um, is usually something that they have down. Um, right. But I don't work with them on that. I work on building their businesses uh, profitably. I love hearing, and you probably know this about me. I, I love hearing how people got into freelancing because I, I think it's probably as high as 95, maybe even 99% of people is that, that story. I was doing what I do or learned to do it on a job and I just realized that I could probably do it from home and enjoy life a little bit more, things like that. And so I just gave it a shot and started off as a side gig until I could get it to the point. And I just, what you know what I love about it, I think, is the fact that there's still so many more humans out there in a job. I'd say sitting in an office, but now they're sitting at home. <laughs> um, <laughs> wondering, maybe even more than ever, wondering the same thing. It's like, one, now I've learned how to work from home. And so maybe I'm even more likely to be able to do this on my own. And especially, like you said, yeah. writing, writing is definitely a niche that is well taken care of in a business using freelance support. Absolutely. Yeah. And good point. Now people are realizing, well, wait a minute, I didn't think I would want to work from home or, but now that I've been forced to for the past few months, this is actually right. not bad. You know, I actually like the flexibility and, and all that. Yeah, and they've probably already begun to find ways to learn how to use Zoom and and get that 
that need that a lot of us have that um, to just interact with other people and the ability. I don't know how, how it is with you guys. You're in right outside of Atlanta, right? Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't, I don't keep track of all the cities, but in, in Austin, we can now, you know, get together, have coffee and things like that. As long as you're six feet apart, wear a mask if you're up and about. So a lot of that is we, we, we can go back and start doing some of that. Yeah. So we're not as Agreed. isolated as we were. So one of the questions and that I, I found interesting when you and I were talking and, and through the notes that you sent over as well is our concept this year or theme this year is breaking boundaries. And what's interesting about that is I come up, came up with that last fall and not even knowing what we were going to be in the middle of this year. And so I feel like as freelancers and independent workers in general, we've already broken a lot of boundaries. So in in coaching, a lot of the humans that you work with, what, what does that typically mean if people are breaking their boundaries? I think the biggest thing is just uh, building and growing a business on your own terms. Uh, so there's a huge difference that I see between uh, freelancers who uh, are taking orders as opposed to those who are very, uh, very purposeful about what they want to do and what they want their business to look like. Uh, most people get into this thinking, I'm lucky if I get work, you know, I'm, I'm in a, as an order taker, what do you need done? Um, the problem is you're letting someone else direct your business uh, as opposed to you setting, setting the course. And a lot of people, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying they're bad. These are many cases, very, very experienced, very talented people. They've just never been in a situation where they get to control that. I mean, most of us mm -hmm. who were employees for a long time, we were we were given the work, right? I kind of joke that it's kind of like the old, you're at your desk, there's like an in-basket and an out-basket. <laughs> yeah. The work comes in on the in-basket, right? And you're cranking it out and you're putting it on the right side on the uh, out-basket. And that's, it's a metaphor for, I think, the way most of us have operated so hmm. think about that. That's reactionary, right? As opposed to being proactive and saying, well, wait a minute, what, what's my vision? Like, what do I want to create here? What does my ideal day look like? Uh, what, what does it mean to have this kind of flexibility? What kind of clients do I want to work with? Um, what kind of projects do I want to work on? What kind of income do I want to generate, yeah. right? So it's about being very purposeful and decisive on those things. And then that's the bar, right? That's the guidepost. So those are the guideposts. And then working backwards from there. Okay, so great. I'm here. This is where I want to go. How do I get there? As opposed to, I'm here, open for business. You know, who needs something done? And that's the way. Again, most people do it, but you're not going to be breaking boundaries that way. In fact, that's a very fast path to burnout. Yeah, I think I've taken that path a time or two. <laughs> yeah, we all have. <laughs> Because you, you you think you're going to do it a little bit different and it's all you know. It's it's hard to do things different when you don't know what you don't know. I've, I've said that statement probably a million times and people have heard it on here. And there there's probably a few people out there going, okay, here she goes again. Yeah. But I, I believe that it's the truth. So real quick, for those of you guys that are out there, um, I would love to know if you guys want to go ahead and start putting into comments so we can come back around and maybe address them. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Is there a boundary that you feel like you're just keep coming up against in your freelance business, whether you're in writing, it does, you know, regardless of industry, I'd love to just get a feel for what those boundaries are that you're feeling out there. And it takes a while for those to come through. So I wanted to go ahead and push that out there. So by the time we got around to it, it was there. The other thing that we've talked about a lot is just the process of getting progressively better clients which means you're getting better projects, which usually means you're getting better money. So I hear people talk about, and I know you do too. I just want my income to stabilize. I just want steady clients. And it really kind of goes back to what you were just talking about, being proactive about how I'm going to go about it. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it, uh, all those things. You're right. They're tied together, but um, that's not, that's not the natural direction. So the default state of those things is not great. It's like you're going to be carried away and you're going to be working for crappy clients on projects that nobody really wants to work on. And you're going to be taking bargain basement fees, you know? So um, a lot of it has to do with, again, making those decisions 
And, uh, and we can talk more about this, but it's digging deep as to, okay, so this is where I want to be. You can't just be here. What do I have to offer that's aligned with that? You know, because here's the thing, and this is really important. The world does not need another freelance designer, another freelance writer, or content marketing professional. Like, that there are plenty out there. Okay, that's not what the world needs. The world needs freelance professionals who are very clear about what they bring to the table. And they say, look, here's what I have. Here's the value I can deliver. Here's my experience just to, to prove that. Um, is, is that attractive to you? You know, are you in that situation? Are you this type of organization? If so, let's have a conversation. That's kind of the message you need to send out. Because um, again, this comes from that employee mindset. If you're like, here we go, I'm open for business. You hang your shingle. And it's like, my website's up. What's going on? How come I'm not getting anything? That's not going to do it. And here's Um, the million things that I do. Yeah, here's a million things that I can do. And adding to that list, by the way, actually is worse. It dilutes your message. You're casting too wide a net. So being more specific uh, would be the second thing. So it's purposeful and then being digging deep, taking an inventory, being specific as to whom you can help. When you can help everybody, you help no one. Um, And... um, and then iterating along the way. So a lot of people get stuck here because they take that second step, but then they spend months trying to figure this out. Because I gotta, you know, I gotta come out. When I come out of the gate, I mean, it needs to be right. And I think we need to take more of a um, like a Silicon Valley uh, approach to this, which you're rapid prototyping. Okay. So we're gonna right, we're gonna make some decisions. We're gonna put it out there. We're gonna see what what happens. And then we're going to course correct along the way. We're going to iterate because that's the way business is anyway. I mean, we're not creating, you know, fortunately we're not designing a Boeing, a Boeing jet. We're, we're creating things that we, we have the ability to just rapid prototype and just make it up as we go. And we change. I mean, you talked about going deep. I'd actually like to go back to that a little bit, just because I hear some of these statements and we all make them, you know, go, I, I could probably come up with them, but we make these statements of, hey, go go deep. Can you give us maybe an example or two of what that really means? Are there some questions that we could maybe be asking ourselves that help us go a little bit out of our comfort zone? I know that's one of your pillars. Yeah. So um, I like to go through this exercise and what you could do is just take a sheet of paper and you um, you put it in landscape mode, right? So horizontally and you draw four boxes. So you got four quadrants. Top left quadrant, what I recommend you do is that's your inventory. That's an inventory of your background, your experience, different jobs that you've held, passions, interests, hobbies. Those should go in there too. It's probably not going to come from that part of the list, but this is a brainstorm. Okay. So just a brain dump, put it all in there. And then what you do is um, you take several days for that because usually you don't get them all down this, the first day. Then you kind of start consolidating, crossing things out that you know aren't going to go. You, they're just not going to go anywhere. And um, for what's left, what you want to do is you want to take each one individually and run them through each of the next three quadrants. Okay. Okay. So the next quadrant it's going to be top right corner, and the, the that quadrant is all about your network. Okay. So let's just take say that well I used to work in. I don't know, an in insurance, like I've had six years experience. In fact, that was my last career in, in the insurance field. Okay. Do you know people in that industry still? Okay. Did you make connections? And this is really as simple of asking yourself, you know, do I feel really good about that? Do I feel okay? Or do I have nothing there? Okay. And the way I like to do it is a check plus check or check minus. Okay. Self-explanatory, right? Sticking with insurance, you go to the lower uh, left quadrant, and that's about, okay, based on what I know, what do I feel is the demand for the type of work or the services that I want to offer? And again, we're not looking for deep dive into research or anything like that. We're just trying to get a gut feel. Well, and let's just say that I'm a content marketer. Yeah, the insurance industry produces quite a bit of marketing materials. I just happen to know that. Great. So that would be a check plus. Some others might be a check. Some others might be a check minus. In fact, many of the hobbies type things usually are check minus, but you know, not all of them. Yeah. And then lower right quadrant would be the people and 
in the topics or the type of work. So based on what I know, how do I feel about the people that I might be working with, the topics that I might be writing about, the kind of work that I might be doing? This is really kind of a final gut check because there are many professions where everything checks out. Insurance, yeah, man, all the way, got a network, we know they do a lot, but then I get to that. And the thought of writing about insurance or dealing with anything insurance related again, just, yeah, makes me sick. So you should pay attention to that. It doesn't mean you cross it off, but that's a check minus, okay? Yeah. So you go through each item on the top left quadrant, which is your short list of in your inventory, and you just, you know, add them up. And, and you could even do points if you wanted to, if you want to take a really methodical approach. But really, it's just a gut check. My experience has been that one or two of them typically surface is like, okay, these are kind of the given. But yeah. I'm glad I ran him through this because there was one that I thought was going to be it and it didn't score real well once I took all these quadrants into account. Does that make sense? It does. It, it's actually, I, I taught a class here for a few years. What do we call it? Um, it doesn't matter what the name is, but it was it was a fun name. So I was hoping to remember it. But oh, Jumpstart. <laughs> I, I thought it was a, a cool name. So it was the, you know, get all the, the nuts and bolts of how to run a freelance business. And the first thing we did is I call it a skills assessment. And I would have people do kind of like you said, I gave everybody these great big blue things and we put them on the wall, you know, great big sticky notes and a marker. And they would just sit there for however many minutes and write everything they could. Like you said, hobbies, skills, doesn't matter how far off they are. If it's stuff that you can do, put on there. And then yeah. they went through, we took them through a pro process, not quite as in depth as yours. I love yours, but it was one of the questions that you have to go through and compare it against was, um, do you love doing it? The other one was, do you hate doing it? <laughs> Mark mm -hmm. it off. Cause what's the point of going down that road if you really can't stand doing it. And then I think the last one was, is it marketable? And yes. then what we would do, I did, I actually found this super helpful, which is probably what happens in working with yourself. Like, a, you know, working with a coach in this is we took the whole class. You would have to turn around and tell everybody what you ended up with. And everybody got to give you some feedback because somebody may have said, you know what, you show that you love this and you're not showing it's marketable. And I can tell you it is. And that happened a lot. Ah, uh, yes. That's good. And they're like going, how, how is it marketable? One of them was, I remember a student, it was email campaigns. It's like, it, you really don't think writing email and creating campaigns is marketable? And she says, no, um, we need to chat. <laughs> Yeah. I, can, I can literally fill up your docket this afternoon with people that I know, like, you know, but people, you know, it, it goes back to the, she, she didn't know what she didn't know. And in her mind, she's like, on, it's writing emails. People can write their own emails. Mm, no, we can't. <laughs> no, no. You, in fact, that's a good sign. If it, if, if it feels easy to you, it usually means oh, that you're, you're very good at it. Yeah. You just don't think twice about it. And you kind so, of yeah, that's, assume everybody can do it. Exactly. Exactly. And don't, you know, don't automatically assume many times there are here. We just talked really more about target markets than we did about skills, although you can do the same thing with skills. True. But um, there are many that you might be tempted to take off the list because it doesn't seem to really have legs like nonprofits, for instance, you know, I worked at a nonprofit for three years. It wasn't a long time, but my role was in marketing. and I'd learned a ton. But based on what I know, um, I, a lot of nonprofits don't have the budgets to, to pay me what, what I right. would like to earn. Well, look at it. Um, that's a one dimensional view of it. I like to talk about adjacent markets. So if you put nonprofits in the middle, think of like a grid, what's on top of that, what's below, what's lateral. Uh, right. For instance, what about companies that sell into nonprofits? You know, and I yeah. had a coaching client, that's exactly, he was stuck in the nonprofit world. As soon as we took him out of that and we started focusing on, hey, your your gift is being able to uh, help organizations that sell into nonprofits uh, with their marketing. And his role happened to be one where, man, I, I'm, that's great because I would be writing for the people that had my role, you know, so I get your, I get your target market. I get your prospect and i mean his his business blew up in a, in a big way oh that's because awesome of that. so yeah don't just think of it there in the middle think about you know kind of vertical and horizontal where do they fit 
And going back to that second pillar, if truly knowing what you bring to the table, that to me, it sounds like that's really where, where we're starting to get to is when you hone into, and you may not get it right the first time, you know, you may it, going through, I can say going through either list, regardless of how you go through it, you could still run, get to the bottom and you're almost there, but going to your concept of let's, let's iterate this, you know, maybe it's writing to go back to my example, maybe it's writing email copy, but specifically for a vertical or a couple of verticals, not just for everybody. And you yeah. may get into it and totally not like it because you're writing for a vertical that just doesn't do anything for you. Or maybe you went too broad, you know, you said uh, email marketing, but you didn't talk about, well, what specifically type of email marketing, you know, maybe you're really good at campaigns, you know, and, and a lot of the people you're going after think that you're trying to get uh, to their, uh, write their newsletters, you know, and maybe that's not what they really want help with. Yeah. So, it, yeah, but don't get too specific at first, you know, it's, um, leave, leave the options open <clears throat> because it's, here's the thing. Like it's, if, if you're jumping into this at first, you may think, you know, what's going to really uh, strike, but you, you don't. So I, I like to, to think of it as the um, it, it, picture uh, like an inverted pyramid, you know? So at the top, it's too broad. Hey, I, I write for anybody, you know, any, all businesses, um, and then at the bottom is I write for this specific type of medical device companies. That, that's too narrow. So you want to be somewhere in the middle at first. It's safer because you are specific enough that you can actually attract the attention of the right prospects. Right. But it's not so specific that you you know you you miss out on a ton of opportunities that could have been great. Yeah. No, I get that too. Cause I can say that there's been more than just a couple of opportunities that were in that more in the middle area, but mm -hmm. because it wasn't in what I, I did, I got really intent in the, in the niche thing for a while. And I was like, this is really fun. So it turned out that I didn't, I didn't even go down and do the niche stuff because I found other things that I enjoyed. Yeah. There you go. So paths will open up and you just follow that again, rapid prototyping, right? We won't, yeah. you'll never get there unless you try different things and iterate it along the way. And we're humans and we're just, we're ever changing as humans, you know, and you learn things. And, you know, if, if somebody would have told me that I would be running a conference and some of the things that I do now, you know, well, let's just say quite a few years ago when I graduated high school, I would have laughed at them because I had no interest. All I wanted to do was go to school, become an engineer, and I was going to be an engineer the rest of my life and work in the oil field. I did actually none of those things. And there so you I, go. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to, I think it's healthy to have um, some, maybe some goals and you can define those things. But yeah. my whole thing is don't get obsessed over that. Use that as a guidepost right? and then just get out there, right? You've heard the saying, you don't need to see the whole staircase. You just need to take the first step or the first couple of steps and so the my, path will, will appear in front of you. And it does. So my story actually works quite well here and I'll just, I'll, I'll stay short with it. But I, I say I didn't achieve any of those things, but I kind of did. So I went to school and I did my first two years of engineering and in a, they call it a, I think a two, three program, you do two years in a community college, and then you go to your university to finish up your engineering degree. So I did those two years and decided that, you know what, there's, I can't sit through another lecture. This isn't who I am. I'm just going to have to find another way around it. So I became an engineering designer, computer drafting person is another name for them. So I did get to work kind of in the oil field, but as a computer aided drafting person. And so I still got to do the calculations. I still actually got to do the work that I imagine myself doing, but I never went all the way and got an engineering degree. So I did that, ended up doing that for 10 years. And that migrated me into learning how to do network engineering and putting in servers. And so, like you said, just kind of follow it and be willing to iterate. And as I begin to learn that, oh, this is really interesting. And I have the skill over here of using the actual engineering software. And now I've learned the skill of the network. And so I can begin to move as in that t time period when we started moving from client based over to, to network. So all that to say, because I was open to being iterative, I learned a lot and I got to do a lot of really cool different things in my career.
But what if you would have been disappointed? Wow, I never got my engineering degree. I never became an engineer. You keep beating yourself up. You know, yeah. that's not the end goal, right? The end, That was a guidepost. And whether you realize it or not, at some point you realize that, well, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm following what, what I know is right, right? As yeah. opposed to this is wrong. I said I was going to be an engineer. I must I'm be such a loser. My, I'm such a loser. My <laughs> parents must be so disappointed, you know, <laughs> and it's not. It's so you need to you need a starting point, but then you need to be flexible along the way. Yeah, I mean, that's that's life. Everyone has that story. You know, some version Everyone. of that story. Yes. Right. So don't think that it's not going to apply here. It's the same thing here. So real quick, let's dive into your third pillar, and that's providing the right context for prospects and clients when selling yourself and your value. And I think we've already kind of talked on this as well, but dive into that. Yeah. So that's that's that bit about um, the world doesn't need another you know yeah. content marketer, or, you know, Facebook ad specialist, graphic designer. What the world needs someone ha who has those skills and understands their market or the market they're going after or their business or knows how to um, talk about your client's problems and come up with collaborative solutions, right? It's in people who are very easy to work with too. That, that's what the world really needs. So, you know, I'm a big believer of, um, you know, charge high fees, but provide the right context. Um, right. So I just had this conversation with someone right before this call. It's like, you know, it's like saying, all right, so um, I uh, I know you've been talking about going away for a week, taking a little break from it all. Um, I found a house for you and it's $10,000 for the week. You'd be like, whoa, 10,000 bucks. If that's all I told you, you would say, nah, I, I'm sorry, I can't make that happen, you know. But what if instead of talking about price first, I gave you the context first? And I know we're getting tactical here, but I, you know, I'll bring it back. Um, what if I said, well, listen, I, I should have let me let me tell you a little bit about this opportunity, this experience. Okay, you're gonna be on top of a mountain in St. John, US Virgin Islands. Okay. The view is magnificent. 360 degrees, you see ocean everywhere. And let me show you the pictures, by the way. The view is amazing. There's this huge infinity pool that's to die for. It's six bedrooms, okay? So everyone's gonna have their bedroom. Did I mention that you're gonna get your own personal chef, you know, concierge, and you're gonna have transportation. Basically, you get a, you get a phone, you, you just dial this number and they come pick you up, take you wherever you want. There's a, there's a boat at the bottom, some jet skis. So anyway, I can keep going, right? But you start like painting a picture in your head of like, whoa. And the price is you know $10,000. Normally this home goes for $20,000, but it's $10,000. This is an unforgettable experience. You'll never forget. You and your friends will never forget about this. Right. Suddenly I understand the value because you can't have value without context. So the whole idea here is, I just give you an example of how you could maybe pitch something, but this you don't even need to wait until you're pitching. Your website should provide that context. So you're not just a writer, for instance, or a graphic designer. You work with these types of organizations to help them solve these types of problems. What makes you different is that unlike so many other graphic designers, <clears throat> I have this experience and this background, and I've worked for these organizations. By the way, when I say work doesn't mean you've been freelancing for these. It can be from you know your your right. career, yeah. um, and um, I uh, you know I, I'm not just a, an order taker and a writer. I'm I work with you. I collaborate with you to to solve these problems. I mean, when you use that kind of language, that mindset, when you approach it that way, totally different context, totally different experience. It doesn't mean that everyone is going to go for it. Okay. What you're doing is you're providing the fork in the road. And that's what you want. Most people are not going to be interested in that. Most clients, most prospects want the low cost provider. That's true in any industry. Okay. Is, so yep. we just need to accept that. But what you're saying is, okay, but then I gave you that fork in the road. It's very clear. If that's not you, if what I'm giving you here resonates, Let's start a conversation. So you're not even trying to sell here. You're just trying to sell, if you're selling anything, really a conversation. Yes. So that's the context. It's 
everything is context and you can't, you know, we need to get away from this price mindset. It's like, you know, how competitive is it? And listen, these are, fortunately, we're not selling commodities. You mentioned oil and gas. Fortunately, we're not selling oil and gas. There's a market for that, a futures market, and you're not going to get a penny above, you know, that for crude oil. Isn't it? Yeah. This is not the case here. You know, um, if you provide the right context, the right value, I mean, you could you could do very, very well. And you don't have to do that from day one. Okay, you can work your way up to that. But yeah, that that's really what it means. Is that Does that make sense? It does. It makes complete sense. So back to, I spent 15 years doing search engine optimization. And one of my niches in SEO was oil and gas. I grew up in it. And there you go. it was, it was the first area that I, I worked in. And so it was for, to be able to find for them, for the client, for to, the client to be able to find someone that had experience in that background. So I began, you know, going back to that example of what I used to teach in that class was I would tell them, man, if you took dance when you were a kid, if you're in gymnastics, if you're in, you know, list all that stuff, because you never know if there's a client that has, I don't know, gymnastics studio. And you're going to be much more likely to be able to talk, especially if you loved the gymnastics, right? If you didn't like it, well, maybe take that off your list. <laughs> but, you know, can talk about, you know, how the experience you had when you were a kid and, and you know, be able to, to, to put that into, in this case, writing or the website or the SEO or, you know, that energy alone, much less. And that's a part of your experience. It is. And it is. So, yeah. so don't discount your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> no, and in fact, I mean, it's not just for that. I, I think when you know, if you're going to talk about your experience, your background, your how you got here, um, we love stories, you know. And and you can get like start with the business stuff, right? A format I love is on an about page is um, g- give them three reasons why you're different from most others, and then have a section with a subhead that reads something to the effect of, and on a personal note, let me tell you a little bit more about me if you're interested, you know, and, and many people read that because they, people want to work with people and they just, they're curious. We're all curious. And if you structure it as a story, you know, that story you just told us about how you ended up here, you know, from oil and gas, you wanted to be an engineer and you took this kind of indirect path to, you know, uh, working with engineers and working, you know, on, on things that, that interest you anyway. So that that's all interesting. I started my first about page, my first like real about page. So I had a candy store out of my garage when I was eight years old. I just oh, did wow. it fascinating. And I told the story of how I started that. And basically what happened is I had, um, I met this kid in another neighborhood. I was going to a tutor in her home and she had a kid my age. And I saw that he was selling candy out of his garage. I'm like, that's just brilliant. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm so burnt out. You know, eight-year-olds talking, right? You can imagine. Right. <laughs> and um, I said, I'll, I'll buy your inventory. Are you ready to get rid of it? I'll buy it. And uh, I'm not sure what, I don't remember how that conversation went, but I bought, I bought him out. You know, and I borrowed money from my parents and I bought him out. And my parents said, yeah, that's, that's great. You know, we, you, you can start your own. So I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to wait. I remember it was the afternoon. My dad was still at work and I just got on my bike and put all that candy in a bag and I sold it all door to door that day, you know? <laughs> You're awesome. So there's, there's something there. It's an interesting story, I think. And, and, and that's my whole point was I've always been in sales and marketing, you know, ever since I was eight years old and I told that. So it's it's engaging. That's all context, you know. So yeah. all that is context. Yeah, and I I would say that almost every girl out there probably has a story, something kind of like that of our uh, wagon full of Girl Scout cookies. And yes. <laughs> you know what what stories, what interactions did you get from that? So I love I love that because it really kind of triggers or inspires us to think outside of the box. As much as I don't like that term so much, but really look at, look at your childhood, the good, the bad, the ugly, and how can you create those stories and how can you design your story that's going to be attractive to engage your perfect target market? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the the beauty of that is that we, there are signs of what we do now and who we are back then. 
So there yes. were signs one a week connect, like Steve Jobs said, connect the dots going, you know, oh, backwards. Yeah. Right. Why don't we go ahead and instead of saying this is I'm this way or I have these qualities, why don't you start with a story? It doesn't have to be just about your childhood. I think I'd pick three, you know, like my first job, my childhood, my first job, and then transitioning into what I do now. Okay. And uh, so three pivotal points. And I just, you know, and, and then what you're able to do is now you've taken them here and now they get it as opposed to starting there and then having to explain it. So, yeah. So, so if we're talking, so I don't know, this would help Emily, but you know, that's the marketing piece, right? Cause I think you need right. three things. So there's a, you got to market yourself. We're not in a job where the work comes in on the in basket goes out. You got to go out and hustle. So that's something that everyone needs to understand market yourself. Unfortunately, you're going to have to do it. I say, unfortunately, because at first it feels that way, yeah. but look, it makes you better. Okay. So that piece has got to be there and don't think that, well, I'll find a way where the work comes to me. That don't start your business thinking that way because it's, you're going to be very disappointed. So marketing yeah. is, is huge. It is. And then learning how to convert that and then how to grow it. One of the things that, and we're, we're, we're kind of out of time, but I want to see if we can chat about this because I love it. The, this third part of grow as a freelance business owner, that is, it can be all over the board. And when people yeah. hear it, eventually they just absolutely buy into, I see it so often where grow means that I have to get bigger and start bringing people on board. And it can mean all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I, I want to sit here and the, maybe the two of us give everybody permission to redefine grow. And so how about you? What is, give me a couple of ideas of, um, cause I know you work with quite a few different people of what grow could look like for a freelance business owner. That's not necessarily bringing on employees and building out a huge agency or something to that effect. Yeah, absolutely. So you see the path, right? So you market, you convert as many of the right ones into profitable clients. And then that leads to growth. It's like, well, how much of that do I do? Because I'm starting to get really busy. You need to decide what kind of business you you want to yeah. run. Okay. You may not know now. I'd say, ask yourself that question now, but the answer is going to get clear as you go along. Scaling that way where you create kind of a mini agency, that's just one flavor of growing. There are many different flavors. So I'll tell you one, the one that I chose. The one that I chose was earn more in less time. I didn't want the complexity of having to manage a team of writers. Okay. Many people do, but if you do make sure that you know, that's what you want to do. Yes. I've coached people who, when they came to me, eight months before they started going down the path because they thought that's what you're supposed to do. And they were miserable. Exactly. Like yes. So ask yourself, you know, do you, cause that's another, another skill set. Now you have to project manage, you know, you have to do some other things and that's okay. By the way, you don't have to project manage the whole time. You can even hire a project manager, project manager you know, which yeah. is something we could talk about, but you need to decide first what kind of it for me earn more and less time. So what I wanted to do is like, you know what? And I didn't know this at first, but it became obvious as I started getting more of these clients, I want clients who have a lot of work over the course of three plus years. And if I can tell early on when I'm having discussions with them that this is going to be like a one-off thing or maybe a couple of projects, I'm not interested. I really want people who, I, I mean, I, I know it's not a guarantee, but that I'm, they're willing to grow with me. Yeah. And, um, and then I get into a retainer situation where the more I do for them, the more efficient I become. So the more I earn on an internal hourly basis. Yep. Um, so that was me. And I just wanted to get into situations where work less or keep it the same, but keep boosting my income. And that's, that's a great place to be. So if that resonates with you, that's absolutely doable. And if you want to grow something, that's totally cool too. It just depends on what you want and your skill set. And I, I took the exact opposite tack. I love <laughs> the small little projects that I could get in, clean up, be done and walk away. Mm -hmm. And so what with I the same did client, with the same or several, no clients. different clients. I, I okay. actually did not like working with the same client over and over and over again. I don't know why I just, I like to go in and clean, clean up people's messes and hand it back over to them. I don't mind if they bring me the mess back in a year or two, but I don't necessarily want to clean the mess up every month. And I just got really good at knowing what I could do, my boundaries for doing that. 
put together some like package pricing sort of thing. And so they had no idea that I could go in and clean something up. It only took me an hour or two because I priced it based on what I believed it was worth for them to have that done. Mm -hmm. And I like that. a couple of days later, three days later, they'd get it back. And, you know, sometimes literally I could get it done in an hour and sometimes it might take five or six hours. So, I mean, sometimes but your fee, fee was the same, right? The fee was, was the same, you know, and every once in a while you'd come into, it was in website design actually is when I got the best at it. My tagline was I fix crappy websites. And I just, I, I had so much fun doing it. So anyway. I love that. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it, you, there's no right or wrong model. There's it not. starts with what you want. And you knew what you were good at and what, I what got, excited you. I got very clear because in SEO, it got into that model of, you know, you charge X amount and you do this every single month for people. And I just hated it. I enjoyed yeah. SEO, but I didn't like the repetitiveness every month. I had to go check on your stuff and all that. I just didn't enjoy that part of it. You want it in and out, kind of like grandparents. They come in, they play with your kids, and they're like, I'm out of here. You deal with these. Brats. Right. Yes. And yes, by the way, they have had like a, I don't know, gallon or two of ice cream and, you know, all the things. Yeah. And here you go. That's your problem now. I did my job and you're happy. I'm happy. Don't, the kids don't call happy. me and we won't call back. <laughs> yeah, right. Love well, I, I have gone over and I appreciate you letting me do that because I knew we had a little bit of a buffer Absolutely. here and we got into conversation and you're always wonderful to talk to. So Thank I you. really appreciate it. Feel free if you guys want to continue to put some more comments in there. I will re reach out to, to Ed and, and try to get those things um, answered. And over to you guys. And then we're also going to be continuing conversations just as a community over in the Mighty, um, Mighty Freelance Network. So I appreciate seeing you guys over there. That's a whole lot of fun. And I'm going to log off for now. Thanks for having me.